In 2020, over 134,000 Australian homes were damaged by extreme weather. And it's a problem that's only getting worse. Cyclones are becoming more widespread, growing in intensity and frequency. Catastrophic floods are displacing more and more communities. And bushfires are causing so much devastation, the whole world is taking notice. It's forcing Australians to become more resilient, but at the same time, it raises an important question. Can you build a house that's as resilient as us? One that protects not just our lives, but how we live. A home that stands up to Australian conditions. Can you build one house to save many? To answer this question, some of Australia's leading experts in home resilience came together. Suncorp provided insight into the impact of natural disasters on communities. James Cook University and the CSIRO on cyclone, flood and bushfire. And Room 11 Architects on resilient design. What would happen if buildings were more resilient? What sort of impact does that have? How do we bring all the learnings from, from the cyclone and storm side, from the st uh, storm surge and flood, from fire, uh, and put that together with, a, with an architectural process? Yeah, so we were approached and asked to create a three bedroom family home that would allow the Queensland lifestyle, but would build in resilience. Um, but we also had to make sure that it, it utilised standard technology um, and use that technology in a, in a more intelligent way in order that the overall cost would be comparable to a standard home. Yeah, it's a problem that we all have to solve together. It's not the government, it's not the industry, it's not the community. Together, we need to come up with what the longer term solution is. Like, this is, this is solvable. Let's build the best house we can. The building that best suits the Queensland lifestyle, of course, is the Queenslander, a home built from the ground up to enjoy Mother Nature at its best. But could it be redesigned to be more resilient in more extreme conditions? If you want to start with a concept that's probably one of the most maladapted houses, um, as a starting point, let's throw a Queenslander out there. It's one of the few vernacular buildings of Australia, mm. and it's, it's the icon. Although the typology is beautiful, it was created for a different period. And like anyone can build a, a concrete or steel bunker, that's pretty resilient, but nobody wants to live in that. <laughs> so we're trying to go above and beyond that to not just protect life, but lifestyle, as you say, and protect memories and homes. And Queensland's now changed and uh, we need to change with Queensland. A Queenslander, to me, it's just so Queensland. Um, she dreamt about it. I dreamt about this house, actually. The garden, just everything about this place, like, we just loved it. We had no sense of fear. When we got the little letter and they asked us to evacuate, they said, you're high risk, you might flood. Don't take it seriously, you'll be fine, mate. You'll be fine. It, rain it just kept raining. It just kept raining and raining. It seemed to every day get heavier and heavier yeah. and heavier, and then there was no breaks, and it just was just like a continued belt of rain. We started seeing it rising at the back. Yep. And it kept rising. And it just kept rising. And by this time, I think I'd had four phone calls from my boss saying, get out of your house. I'm like, no, 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 she'll be right. We're fine. No, we weren't fine. It became serious. Yeah. So it's scary. It is scary. So telling someone about what we went through is really, it was just really scary. The water had come up to about the here. There was a tide mark at least 40 centimetres up on the second floor. All the lower houses, it was roof level. Yeah. We didn't, well, we actually didn't want to take any photos and we got angry at people trying to take photos because we, for some reason, I think it's a pride, I was just mortified. I didn't want people to see um, the house like that. But thank God people did take photos because now we've got a record to show how far we've come and what we've done. We sandbagged the we relevant doorways, we did, we we did this do. and yeah. we did that, but water still 
made its way through. Yeah, the videos, we had wedding videos and... Photo like, albums down low in drawers. In drawers just, like just things that you don't think of at the time. I think, I wish we would have thought of that, but we didn't. Like seriously, people don't get it. They go, oh yeah, you, you can just get insurance and replace it. It doesn't work that way. You lose irreparable memories. It puts massive stress on your pets and yourselves. It's not just a house that never was for us. This was always a really special place and it's our home. One of the issues that you have after a flood is that we've got moisture in the cavities, creating mould, all the plaster will fall to pieces, and then you've got a home that's not inhabitable. Then you've got a certain number of plasterers that are available to fix it, and people are out of their homes for months and months, and it's totally unnecessary. Just because the plaster's fallen off, structurally. Nothing's actually happened to the building. Nothing's happened to the building. Yeah. And it's a really minor thing to change that to a water resistant product. We use fibre cement sheet, it's a standard off the shelf product. But you can just unscrew the timber batten, remove the lining, clean the cavity, get rid of the moisture and screw it back together. You're not cleaning out all this ruined plasterboard that's mm. then going into landfill to buy new plasterboard to put on the walls. You're using the exact same product, you're just drying it off. Water resistant materials are just one way one house protects against flood. Electrical wiring stored in the roof runs to raise power points and retaining walls are designed to divert water away from the home. Every season, every local will tell you that you're one season closer to the next cyclone. Um, you know, and, and again, when that next big one is, who knows? The seasons seem to be getting longer. Cyclone seasons, they seem to be extending out. Everyone knows what's happening. Everyone knows the system. When a cyclone, for instance, is going to be coming, everyone knows that, because it's not just about their property that you're protecting, it's everyone else's property as well. Because everyone up. gets up and, and starts helping, helping each yeah. other. Queenslanders as a whole, you know, we stereotype Queenslanders with the sport, they're, they're tough and um, they get on with, with life. But, but I think in the back of their mind, you, you have that little bit of wisdom of the potential of how nasty weather can be. We prepared for the worst and hope for the best, or we prepared for the worst and we got the worst. The eye went straight over the top of Tully. When, when you could see how big it was and the fact it was going to be Category 5 over the top of us, yeah, that's, uh, that was one of the more worrying moments. One of our neighbours, their roof came off and um, the timber struts had actually speared through our house and we didn't hear it, we, we didn't hear it. Didn't even know until the cyclone had finished. It went through the side of the house, straight through a bedroom, through an overlocker, the overlocker went to bits, straight through the next wall and then into the corridor. If I had walked outside and just seen my house, I probably would have been, I would have tears. been in tears, yeah. yeah. But then when you look around how lucky we were compared to so many others, we felt very lucky, very, very lucky. The original focus of the cyclone testing station here at James Cook University was how do we address life safety because there was a significant loss of life as well as a town being wiped out. How do we bring the engineering expertise into our housing construction so we weren't killing people in bad storms? That then formed building standards and codes over the years. The life safety is pretty well addressed. But of course now the problem, uh, it manifests in another way. There's an assumption that current building codes will fully protect you. Whilst they do protect life, um, they don't necessarily support building resilience into a building. And depending on when you built your home will depend on how the code responded at that point in time. Robustness is there for the event. It's solid, we can shelter in it and we get through. A resilience is that we can live in it afterwards. Can the community get back to where it was as quick as it can since the event went through? And where we live, where we work, where we go to school and everything else is all part of that. The cyclic pressure test we did in the air chamber, applying that dynamic loading as the wind's hitting the roofing. It's all that suction pressure trying to pick up the whole house by its roof cladding. So you need the roofing screws holding the roof cladding down to the battens, the battens holding it down to the rafters, rafters down to top plate. Each of those connections has to be right to make sure a house sticks around. 
The screws that have the larger cyclone assemblies on, that larger surface area of the screw have more load resistance, uh, it defers the deformation of it, and gives you an extended life, and also helps cover up a bit of the sins in installation as well. The Australian standard stipulates this thing here. It's a uh, four kilogram hardwood timber missile, 100 by 50, which is representing an old pre-code timber rafter that is broken off from somebody's house and flying into yours or somebody else's. We can project this thing at 28 meters per second to satisfy the Australian standard. In three, two, one. We clearly saw that non-rated door cannot withstand the standard test debris traveling at that speed. Diamond mesh screen in three, two, one. Similarly for a normal security screen, won't resist the debris, the glass shatters behind, showering anybody sheltering behind that with shards of glass. Having rated type screens away from the elements like the glass of the doors that we're trying to protect, they deform, they don't break the thing behind, that's the part that comes into the one house design features. Projecting debris item into mesh screens, firing in three, two, one. <laughs> We needed to put a balustrade and a handrail on the deck to protect people from falling off when the screens are open. And that's just a standard practice. But then JCU was thrilled with that because that increases the strength of the screens and increases the cyclone resistance of the screens. All these tests are really to try to help get a more resilient design and structure and then combining all of them to give us a, a better resilience product at all, overall. While these robust balustrades and high-performance mesh screens protect one house from flying debris and water ingress, an air pressure relief system and cyclone-rated roof fixings help maintain the building's integrity during severe storms. On the outside, Queenslanders show a brave face to disaster. But on the inside, it can be a different story. Those who experience catastrophic weather events can be deeply affected, and for many, the damage is not just physical. You go, of course, expecting to see damage um, because you've either seen it on the, on the news or you've heard about it, um, you know, from the team. But it's not until you're actually there on the ground that you can really see the impact and the toll that it has, not just on the properties, but also on the people that live in them. When you turn up there, they look shell-shocked. They're totally amazed at the destruction that's gone on around them and the fact that they've survived, and it's almost as though they have survivor guilt. And as soon as you start to talk to them, just have a natural conversation, is when it hits them and they start to break down. It can sometimes take 12 months to rebuild a home um, when there's hundreds of them in the same community that need to be rebuilt as well. And it's soul destroying you know, to be living out of a caravan or a tent for six or eight, 12 months while your house is being put back together. Uh, and it's not just the accommodation challenge, it's all of the psychological and social issues. People's mental health deteriorates, their, their sense of worth in the community deteriorates, and the longer it goes on, the higher that cost. There's no way we can stop these storms or cyclones or floods from happening. But if we can actually reduce the amount of damage that that weather causes to properties and then therefore lowers the cost to actually repair the homes, then we can actually afford to start lowering premiums. I think it's something like 97% um, is spent on the build and the repair as opposed to 3% spent on the prevention. So we absolutely need to flip that and skew that more so towards the prevention. I knew there was a fire and I knew that the town would be impacted, but I didn't believe that it would come so close to homes in the devastation that happened. We got a phone call saying, you got to get out of where you are and get home because your house is under threat. And I still believed, I went, nah, that won't happen. But yeah, then I got a phone call saying you've lost your home. The only house yeah. in our street to go. Oh, you just don't think, I, I never thought, okay, that would never happen to me, ever. I don't believe that we mm. could have saved that home. It was, it was like a war zone too, mm. wasn't it? And by 10 o'clock in the morning, the sky was black, like completely black, it was like midnight. And the smoke and the heat and, like it was quite terrifying for our children, particularly our elder son. He was six at the time and he just kept saying, you know, I don't want to die, mum, I don't want to die. And 
you know, you're driving down the street and there's just houses on fire either side of you. The grass is on fire and it wasn't even the people that just lost their homes. It was the people that had to evacuate. It's the psychological things that the fires and things bring. I mean, that's a huge impact on a small town, a huge impact on anyone, particularly the bushfires come back, which they will. A Queenslander had come from a traditional building approach. It was obviously trying to tackle the, the local climate and you have, have cross ventilation and louvered windows and big, deep timber eaves with timber decks and balustrades everywhere. And it's just like, well, you know, there's five key reasons why it would burn down in a bushfire. Lighting pilots. Two, one, ignition. And people are returning to the site where they've lost their house. They're often confronted with the, uh, well, what, what could I have done? 29, 30, yep, we're on it. Hold that for three minutes. And they very quickly moved to the idea that the fire came through with such intensity that it knocked the house down and burnt it to a crisp. Potential ignite. There it goes. The house has definitely transitioned into its self-destruct mode. But in fact, what really happens is the fire comes and finds a couple of minor ways to get inside the house. And it's actually all the furnishings within the house that burn down over the many hours after the fire. Going back to the cool down phase. End of profile, just a slow burn down now. And it's the heat from the interior of the house, not the exterior, that caused all that damage. So it really comes down to the house's ability to prevent fire and embers reaching the interior of the house. Two minutes. The screens are a really interesting component. Everyone can remember being in grade seven science and heating up the gorse with a Bunsen burner and seeing that heat diffuse. And yet it hasn't been applied to a fire environment or a fire threat. Mesh screen, which is usually up against the glass, and we've just simply moved it away from the glass. But then by doing that, the attenuation of heat until we hit the glass is really significant. Not only survival, but fairly comfortable inside the house. OK, shut down to initial settings. It's about having a house and a place to live after a fire. That's the definition of resilience. The reason why I really feel one house hit the mark is because it's used a combination of relatively conventional building concepts, but put them together in a way that actually has a lot of layers of redundant design built into it, rather than a single shell approach, um, it can't fail. If a bushfire threatens one house, the open plan interior lets occupants clearly view potential danger. Sacrificial guttering helps protect the home from embers and dual water tanks provide water for firefighting and a safe drinkable supply. This is one house to save many. A house designed as a modern take on the much loved Queenslander but one that, unlike a traditional house, will stand stronger against extreme weather. It includes many features which help protect life, but also reduce the likelihood of having to move out or be displaced after an extreme weather event. And despite its beautiful aesthetic, you are looking at the definition of resilient design. One house that can better protect you through the worst that nature can throw at it. One house to start a conversation. One house we can all learn from. One house designed to save many. It's almost your mid-century modern, I isn't know. it? I know, it's my mid-century modern look. I love it. Oh, wow, that's oh, a wow. good idea. That's a great idea, yeah. I guess, you know, the structure of your house is going to stay, it's going to hold. Mentally, you'd be a lot, a lot better off. 
See, that's the Queensland yeah. feature, it's up high. And that's actually really smart. Like if there's houses are getting built which are safer, I think it'll make the community feel a lot safer. To think that, you know, your kids and your kids' kids don't have to do go through this. They've got other options. Be able to get back to normal as quick as possible yeah. is the most important thing. So if you've got like a house like that that's so much more, you know resilient. Resilient. Yeah, it would be nice to have a community that doesn't have to go through that. Mm. Mm, life's hard enough. <laughs> If every Australian had a one house, we'll be more resilient as a community and bounce back faster. We're helping to protect memories and, and reduce trauma after extreme weather events that are just increasing and increasing. I'm hoping that, that they can take elements of the one house package and incorporate into their new design about where they live, where they want to build, how to make that resilient, or how to upgrade their, their existing house. You know, we can rebuild street, you know, homes and streets and communities in a way that will mean they won't be devastated in the same way again. Hopefully the, the legacy can then be applied to, to homes all over Queensland and Northern Australia. What One, one House can really do through, through that is to ignite um, the, a change of mindset in the community from one of someone else is looking after it to I need to be aware and uh, of my own situation. That additive across the community or across a city or across a state, that's when you get change. If every Australian had a one house, we'd all feel a lot closer to nature because we would be living um, in awe of it rather than in fear of it. People don't need to move away. Mm. And yeah, th that's a really important thing for people to be able to continue to live their lives continue to have the Australian lifestyle, continue to live where they've put down roots, where, where the whole family drama has played out. Um, if you, you live in fear of what could happen, the next storm season, the next bushfire season, you know, are, are you really living life?